so we, what we would do, like uh, George and I, is to uh, tackle this whole topic of excellence from looking at the EU policy level a bit. And what is important for me is to start thinking, and that is where I bring in suggestions. How do we start thinking about excellence differently? other than what is there or what we know now. And that, what I'm going to share with you is based on research, but also some practicalities. Having been a teacher for a long time and working on multicultural, multilingual issues, my experiences as it, what it means for this work. So this is what I'll talk to you about. I'll move quickly over this. What is important, I feel, for, for all of us is this part of the presentation. So the policy aspect, and thankfully, our colleagues this morning have touched on the policy, EU level, and all that, so I think we have a fair understanding. To start, I want to point out or note that this whole idea of excellence in our discourse today is stimulated by university, the global university rankings. So now my small university is working so hard to make it. I don't know how far we can go up in the top. Maybe if we come within the first 500, thankfully, before I retire, that would be excellent. <laughs> but we all know the drive now. Every university is working so hard to come in somewhere to belong. And there are positive sides to this, but also negative. Let me share one of the positive side of this whole ranking. So this today, excellence has become a key word at all universities, and I know you're familiar with it. We all talk about university excellence. And it doesn't stay at that level, but what is interesting for me is the fact that the issue about inclusion is a part of the discourse now, which some years back, probably going back to Pat's story, which we're sharing over break time, it wasn't such a big issue to think about inclusion. But today, it is included. And many universities, to meet the criteria to come up there, have to start thinking about excellence differently, not looking at questions of how do we bring different people into the faculty level? How do we bring people who are different other than the mainstream into teaching and learning? So that is important for me. One of the negative things about this whole thing, and I want to think about it differently, you know, I call it academic capitalism, is in a way that this system automatically makes universities that are very strong stronger and the weaker ones weaker. It's just like in a capitalist state, how society functions. And this is what we see in academia today, that all these universities that you see there maintain their positions well recognized, and we are all scrambling students, everyone wants to be part of them, including us, how great it will be to get a faculty position there. You move. That is a negative aspect of this whole rhetoric about excellence. How do we define excellence? And I must point out, I've been looking at the literature, research, uh, document policies, and one thing that I find or stands out is how vague it is as a concept to define. It's not just vague, it's also complex and multidimensional. That adds to the pressure of getting a sound understanding around excellence. And we are open to the discussion with my colleague. But overall, looking at the European Association for Quality Assurance, they link it or they have some indicators of excellence, one of them being quality and exceptionality. Anything that is outstanding in terms of research or teaching and learning is excellence. So when we are talking about excellence at the university level, we mean outstanding student outcomes, outstanding teaching and learning. But it's questionable who is an excellent teacher. We'll come back to that if we have time. We must also take into account the social and the cultural context, and I think we heard it this morning, that has come up a lot. It matters where and in what specific context we're talking about excellence. It's very different in, from the country where I'm coming from, Finland. I know it's very different in Barcelona or in Spain, for example. So context matters. 
We also have to think about the political, which was a very important thing that we've discussed this morning, and I love the discussion, including uh, um, uh, the president of Mainz University, how important to think about politics to the extent that we know universities are not neutral. We are influenced by the power hierarchy and the politics of the day. Who is defining it and the motivation behind it? Is one of them? Is it government? Is it university? Is it student? Who is the one defining? How does student define excellent? And how do we as university staff, faculty, or teachers define excellence? Objective versus subjective indicators. Most of this, and that was my critique of the university rankings, is the subjective nature. And I know you all have your own criticisms about this system. Heavily reliant on research and its impact. So we talk about publish or perish syndrome. Now, we all know it because if you don't publish, you don't go anywhere up. You just stay where you are, and the chances are that if there's a reason to lay people up, you're a target. So all of us are working hard to publish because it's the new way and how universities are going, or the direction we're all moving. That doesn't make it so objective. It's also a relative term, and we know that it's the question about inclusion and exclusive. And for me, that is where I want us to focus more on later on in this discussion and competition and equity. This whole thing about is to one competing and this afternoon at break, I had this nice conversation with my Finnish colleagues. Why we're coming from Finland and we got to meet only here. That's exciting, isn't it? They live in Yuvaskula, I live in Turku. And it took us several years before I met my colleague who worked in the same university. That is how universities are moving towards competition, even faculty against faculty, one office against the other office. We are almost hiding our research plans and what we are because you almost you are afraid that someone will steal your ideas and you want to really protect that. But this is all part of the idea of becoming excellent. Let's look at some criteria, the indicators that we have now quickly. And I'll have to rush over these because robust uh, or progressive strategic governance and management, plans for improvement. So all universities, faculty, if they claim to be excellent or if they work towards excellent, these are some of the things that they start looking at, some of the indicators. High standard of academic achievement. Student, we are talking about student. But it's unfair here because a student in Harvard, because of the selection system, the student have to write the SAT and they pick the most brilliant student compared to my university where almost it's a pool admission. We admit everyone that applies. How can we compete with these other institutions in terms of student output and achievement? Strong teaching, we know that it's part of it now, but how do we also measure that? Strong teaching or excellent teaching is questionable. We'll come back to it and positive share, um, stakeholder, future employee satisfaction. We know that we are almost now driven by training students for the job economy, uh, the knowledge economy, what consumers want from universities. That has influenced. Commitment to research and academic development, support for social, economic, and cultural development is one other key thing. Commitment to internationalization from a global perspective. And added to that is mobility now. So it's become a very big and important thing that if universities want to become excellent, that they increase or they encourage mobility. So we are all now told in Finland, if you want to apply for funding from the most important organization, the Finnish Academy, as a postdoc, you should have done a mobility moved outside Finland for not less than six months. If that's one criteria. If you haven't had that, you don't meet that condition, you should move universities within Finland. You cannot be in the same. So there are strict criteria that young researchers have to face as part of the uh, move towards excellence. Promotion of equity and academic. We've heard that a lot this morning, so I wouldn't repeat that. This is all part of the indicators for university excellence. Now I have these two examples. I compare USA 
and Finland. Time wouldn't allow us to go into the history in Europe, but Germany is a good example. Germany influenced France, and France influenced some other countries, including Finland. I'll share their example later. But in the US, these are, this is how they measure excellence. One of the group that uh, uh, measures this is the Carnegie uh, Classification of Institutes of Higher Education, the US Department of Education. This is their scorecard. They look at graduation and retention rate, cost, financial aid debt, earnings after school, the SAT, the SAT, which is high stake exam, entrance exam that students have to take to enter universities, including Harvard, all this stuff. And so that is like a gate gatekeeper. We <coughs> use that to fault a student who gets in and who do not get in. And we also have the US News report that uses these criteria as measuring what universities are doing and how excellent they are, their output. Here is Finland. In 2008, the Finnish higher education institution invited people, universities to, to anonymously submit applications so they would select centers of excellence. So all universities did submit applications. They went through it and selected a few. If you went through the first round, then an international expert group comprising international experts in higher education and some Finnish came to university and access you based on this criteria. After that, they awarded some centers of excellence, which University of Sulku has, I think, quite a few, three or four, and Obo Academy has one or two, like that. So it's still happening, and they have to go through these rounds. And these are highly competitive. Universities are working towards that, on board meetings everywhere. This is what we are talking about. These are some of other criteria that one had to go through, or Finnish universities have to go through as part of meeting or becoming an excellent. <coughs> Again, I'm rushing through because this is not the big part of it. What about the European level? This is, these are some of the things that, looking at the literature and looking at the documents and report, these are what are some of the conditions to meet. It becomes internal assurance, policy for quality assurance, design and approval of programs, student-centered learning. I thought that was very important, teaching and assessment. But how do we do Almost all the documents I read, they question it. How do we measure this? student learning and assessment, the uh, really subjective thing that we find in the document. Here, we'll start with suggestions so that I'll engage with the dialogue with my colleague. After looking at all this, I think that we should rethink university excellence. And I propose these three. Inclusion, diversity, and social mobility, which work together very well because if we don't move, we don't learn. And I'll share a few research with you what is said. So when we start looking at excellence, we should start thinking about assessment. Who are the professors? Your experiences. How similar is it with students? That brings you to question. I asked a question this morning. How many universities have someone like me there? And research has shown that having a person like me on the faculty accounts for student performance to a great deal. It does support, including the mainstream student, not just international student. Why? Because I'm diversity in practice, in reality. I wouldn't teach like a native would teach. My, everything about me is different. My language, I have accent, everything shows diversity. So this brings some richness into the system. And this is how we do it. So who are our professors? We can all reflect about our schools and institutions. Who are the students? Are they all entirely national students? Or we are bringing in, and I like the examples this morning, the work they are doing, Austria, Barcelona. It's just inspiration. It's excellent to hear this, what people are doing in different countries. It's so important that we, going forward, this is how it should be if we want to attain excellence, that we allow more students to come in and be part of the um, schooling system and to experience what we have. What is the institutional clim climate? Which programs? Educational, we are talking about all this, support and promote ethnic gender, social, and linguistic diversity. Is the education accessible to everyone, regardless of their ethnicity? We're talking about some had example about student allowances, and I'm happy that, but for example, in Finland, when I was a student, as an international student, I wasn't entitled to the, the, the allowance the student got. 
that matters. I had to work. And if I have to use my evenings to go and work and make money to pay for rent and my living, how do I complete assignments? It matters. We have to think about it going forward as well. Now, what are the benefits of the new proposal that I have? We will look at it at the student level, workforce, faculty, and social level. I wouldn't touch on all of them. You can see them. But let me pick a few here. Democratic citizen, higher levels of student satisfaction. Research has shown over and over again that having diversity inclusiveness, and by inclusive, we don't just mean student population. It's about how we teach the content. Are we just using literature that is familiar? And I had this interesting debate with colleagues back home at the university, how some of my colleagues teach using literature that is published by their own colleagues. They don't even look outside the university. because Why? They want to promote the publications of their colleagues. They want to make it visible. And the only way is to use their literature. Is this diversity? Is this inclusive? Not even a university outside the, in another city, no. We have to start thinking about these things. We should be diverse. Because the literature shows that students, when they see diversity in the teaching, including content, then the outcome also improves. And we have a lot of references for that, but we can't go into that. Workforce, we cannot overemphasize cross-cultural uh, competence. We need it today. I mean, we don't have power over who you are going to work with. This is why students need this competence going forward. And the way we can prepare them is to open up and really let them experience what diversity is and what it means to be culturally competent. We can't just stay at the rhetoric level. Theories, it doesn't help so much. Students really have to see it on campus. And that includes bringing in more international students. Faculty, if we have diverse student population, then faculty have to rethink their approach to teaching. And that is why it's also important that my own experience, I can share a few things with you here, is that it's hard for faculty to start really looking into changing their own teaching and practices without having an example. For example, my presence at the faculty now has meant that they have to start communicating in English. Until that, they did not even pause to think about how hard it is to start speaking in a language that is not your mother tongue. Now, they have the opportunity to think in that, that, wow, I am not a native English speaker. I have to now process my thought and engage in a conversation in that. That is an important learning for faculty. It wouldn't happen without my presence there because I don't speak the native language. We have to communicate in English. And this is important for society. We all know that we is getting diverse. This is not going to change. So we have to start thinking about these questions about society changes. How do we see our society change? And how can we strike or achieve excellence if we don't start at the university level? Now, how can we facilitate inclusion? I think it's about everyone here, including as we understood this morning, government, starting from the government, ministries of education, you can call them whatever name, agencies. I think what is important here, and I mentioned funding organizations, very important, because it matters. We all heard how much money is important in this equation. We can leave it out of the equation. But if we start looking at the standard of most of the funding, they leave a lot of questions for us to think about. Are we aiming at excellence at all? And then we, higher institutions, which we've heard a lot about. But what is important is the synergy. I don't think it's either one of these. We all have to work together. It's something that we, government, funding organizations, and higher institutions have to engage in this. That How do we achieve excellence? That is important. I'm going to emphasize a bit about our job because I'm at the university. That should be fast. And I mentioned here, universities must be intentional, very important, support faculty in their instructional academic staff about their roles as teachers and teachers scholars promote to promote teaching. Now I talk about that. We have to rethink the publish or perish syndrome. 
Almost university teachers have to publish one article a year now in most universities. That allows them no time to even focus on the teaching. And this is one of the biggest complaints that faculty have. How do I meet this standard? How can I be an excellent teacher when all the time goes into writing an article, collecting data and writing an article? So most of us engage in action research. But it's time. It's, we don't have the time to focus on learning and improving our own learning. That's a big question for us to think about as faculty. How can this be done? That's a question. And I have here the High Impact Practices Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. And I would say that here we know what is good teaching because my own research have focused on this question. What is good teaching at the university level? And I've spent a lot of time doing this. High impact practice include group work like project work, an assignment where there are a number of students working together, classroom discussion, all these collaborative works, critical reflection, having questions for students to reflect on it. These are part of that. How many of us use this? That's the challenge. The literature shows that very few teachers use these methods. But it's one key area if we want student improvement, uh, uh, to uh, learning to improve. Scholarship of teaching and learning. The, that's where my colleague will talk about the importance of research in our teaching. Culturally responsive teaching. And I'll show you a bit about that, so let me go. And then openness. Openness, we're also talking about over lunch. Be open about methods of teaching, science today we are talking about sharing data, everything, data, every work we do should be open. And that includes teaching. It should, we should be very deliberate about opening up our teaching. Peer mentoring should go happen more. Now, talking about responsive teaching. Over years, I just got a notice that it's been published, so you can actually see this article after seven years of teaching, working on multicultural education <laughs> and preparing teachers, I learned over years of collecting data that these things matter at the higher education level. If we can achieve or if we strive to be responsive teachers or if we want to improve student retention and um, outcomes, that responsive teacher behavior and attitude, responsive learning environment, responsive teaching strategies. There's a lot. I cannot go into them here. The article, if you want, I can share it with you so you look, you see more about it. But these are important practices that we have to engage. The question, are we doing it? I doubt the percentage of teachers that have the time because it requires a lot of energy and work to do these things. And we have the time. That is where the question comes in. The last question I have is, who is responsible? Who should work towards excellence? And I think it's all about us, you and I, of course, we have authority, we have the bosses, so I think it's a bottom-up thing. And I heard this this morning as well. It's not just about people at the university, the faculty, it's also about people in power. Politicians, it's about even at the university level, the president, the faculty level, the deans, head of department, and it trickles down to us. We all have to work together to make this happen. Do I really implement in my own teaching practices that support student learning? That's the question. Do we reflect on who we are teaching? Our teaching practice, our behaviors. That's the question I'll leave with you so my colleague will take it from there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark.